Welcome back to the hood. This is Chill on the Green Box with Spec Thompson and The View. And like always, my co-host, he, he, he fails to show up, but this time, he, he he's sick. Like He said he got the new COVID, you know, and I've been around him, so I got a little sore throat myself, so, you know, he had to go. So today was my call, like, you got to get the hell on. <laughs> but uh, thanks, Michael, for coming on anyway. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. Thanks for having me. Uh, for people who don't know you, uh, give people a little brief introduction of who you are and what you do. Oh, well, my name is Mike, Mike Watson. I'm the uh, publisher for Freestyle Comics. So, so what's a mo- by the moniker of uh, Most Epic. Uh, we are, our flagship title is Hot Shot, along with uh, Five Star, Emerald Quest, Heroes International, Spider Squirrel, uh, Tetris Gates, Cypher, Hot Shot and Friends. Uh, we, we have over 12 different titles that we published. We're up to 37 books. Um, been doing comic books for over 20 years and uh, just having a good time making books and going to conventions and working within the indie community. That's dope, man. That's dope. Um, well, I don't know what part of the East Coast you're on, but uh, do y'all have the green electrical boxes in front of your neighborhoods uh, growing up? Or now? The green electrical boxes. No, we ain't got those. Well, so... I guess it might be it might be a southern thing. I don't know. It varies from different guest to guest, but it's like these green electrical boxes that sit in front of the neighborhood. Uh-huh. And um, and as a kid, people sometimes people still do it. And they will sit on and hang out, you know, talk to their friends and whatnot. Um, talking to some guests, I realized that sometimes that spot is with the bus stop. That's why after school and the weekends, we'll gravitate back to that same spot because it was the uh, I guess the bus stop we meet up there anyway. Well. This show is basically just that, you know, just hanging out, chilling, you know, on the green box. And uh, and I got like four different segments of this show that, you know, uh, uh, got people to know who you are because I've been on plenty of podcasts and the creator get on there for two hours and talk about their book and nobody knows anything about them or a reason to support them. So I created this show for people to find out more about the creator and give them a reason to support them. That's very much so appreciated. So uh, my first segment is called Breaking It Down because... Uh-huh. On, on that green box, you break down multiple things with friends, like concepts, ideas, and a lot of stuff. So I got a couple icebreaker questions for you so we're going to break your brain down so people know more about you. <laughs> All right. All right. My first question for you, uh, what's the most boring part of your day? The most boring part of my day? Ugh. Yeah. I don't know if I really have boring parts of my day, man. <laughs> You gotta have some downtime. I mean, like, you're like, oh man, I wish it's be like five minutes shorter. I, I guess uh, collating pages, <laughs> <laughs> renumber, uh, probably putting a trade together and retyping out each one of those pages in the order because we just had to do that with our newest trade because uh, we, we added new content to it, so we had to redo all the pages. Uh, oh man, yeah, stuff like that is boring. <laughs> it's like our yeah. over 100 pages oh yeah so that, that, was a, that was a good couple hours you know <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely alright um, my next question Where's, what is the weirdest food you have eaten shrimp shrimp oh yeah I'm a very picky eater man uh, I, I deserve a few things that I, I will uh uh, I hate seafood. Uh, ever since my mama whooped me for eating it, uh, she was you got, it was all, you got whooped for eating it. Uh, we got, well, let me rephrase. I got whooped for doing what I said I was gonna do. Like if I ate it, I was gonna throw it up. And my mama said, "Well, that's all we got to eat in this house until I get paid, and that's all the food. So you better eat it." And I'm like, "If I eat it, I'm gonna throw it up. And if if you eat it, I'm gonna whoop you." And I was like, "I had no choice. I ate it." <laughs> but, uh, and she, so I vowed never to eat seafood again. But then I got to college, and I was out uh, with some. I was out with some people, and I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna stay in my box. I'm I'm gonna try some seafood. We out here at the Hibachi. I was like, let me have some of that shrimp. And uh, they grilled it up. I ate one. I was like, mm, you know what? This ain't half bad. Let me try another one. And I guess my tongue had suckered me. Uh, I, <laughs> it all came back to reality, man. It tastes like bursting flesh. I couldn't. Oh eat man! Sick. I couldn't eat the rest of my food, and this is why I vowed off 
eating anything from the sea unless the zombie apocalypse breaks out. Oh, man. That, so, what about pond stuff? What about, like, gator and uh, frogs and stuff like that? Not happening. <laughs> Not happening. Oh, that's I, wow. I, I had deer before. Didn't like it. So you don't come from, come from a farm. You're not with it. Hey, if it ain't a chicken or a cow or a pig, can't mess with it. What about turkey? Oh, turkey, fine. Turkey catch all. Can catch all. <laughs> turkey can catch all. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Um, uh, my last question. Uh, what is one of your self care activities? One of my self care activities. Oh, uh. I have a lot, actually. Well, one thing I just need, I, I just need one of them. <laughs> I, I would say uh, watching anime with my kids. Okay. Now, was you in anime before them, or you got into it with them? Well, I got in, I was at, in the anime before them. Okay. All right. So, since you uh, probably got fifteen years on me, so was it uh, was it Dragon Ball, or was it like something like? Uh, what ninja ninja uh ah oh, what's that one? Hey, it's not ninja guided. Well, it was a I it was Akira. Um, Akira. I thought anime was pretty cool, but I wasn't crazy about anime. I wasn't, you know, trying to watch it as much as I do now or whatnot. I've uh I've become more infatuated with anime since I've been out of college. Um you know, seeking out new animes and watching them with my kids, watching them with my wife. Uh, like in in college, I just, I guess I just did it because it was there. And it was, you know, I it was like, oh yeah, when I watched it, I was like, oh yeah, that's dope. But I didn't seek it out. You know? Okay. All right. Um, see, see, like, uh, I'm old enough to, for anime had been around, but, you know, we didn't know it was anime. So, like, I always like catered, not catered, but went toward that more. So like with the the Voltron and the Speed Racer and stuff like that. Like I like them shows, you know, better than you know the uh, the He Man's and the uh, Silver Hawk and stuff like that. So Voltron, yeah. Voltron's my favorite show, but I didn't realize it was anime. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you didn't know Speed Racer was anime. You didn't know Astro Boy was anime. You know. Um, but yeah, that's into my. In that segment, uh, on to the next segment, uh, one you might be familiar with, it's called the back issues. You know, if you want to know oh. about, yeah, yeah, you know about that one. See, people yeah. who don't know, if you want to know about a character's uh, uh, origin story, you go to their back issues. So if mm-hmm. you want to know about uh, War Machine, you know, his backstory, you go to his, his origin. I mean, you go to, if you want to know about his origin, you go to his back issues. So right. this segment, we finna go into your back issues, find out more about your origin story. Okay. So, uh, where are you from and what do you call your hood? Uh, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and my hood is just named after the street. I was from St. Clair. St. Clair, okay. Well, uh, that's where I live the most. Yeah, I've been to uh, Cleveland a couple times. Uh, it's wild out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's wild. Um, uh, I did a lot of music stuff. We did a little traveling with artists, and uh, it was the first place that... Uh, the security was beefing with the people in in town. So like, uh, we was at the club. People just come to fight the security. It was, it was crazy. Oh yeah. And um, one time we was there, um, you know, security searching the guy to get in the club. And I guess he touched him one too many times and whatever. Dude pulls out a gun and shoots the security right in the back and lays the security right there in front of the door. I was like, man. hey, hey, clean up this man. Uh, I actually never had any situations with guns in Cleveland until I came back from my first break from college. Never mm-hmm. had a break with guns. Uh, my grandpa, my grandfather had guns, so I've, I've seen guns. I've been around them, whatever. But never had one pulled on me. Never carried one or anything like that. But my very first trip back from to Cleveland from college, I get I get robbed, and I'm like, I've gone 18 years without getting robbed. <laughs> I go, I go, I go out of town once and come back, and see, I get robbed. See, you, you, you lost that Cleveland smell on you, so when you came back, 
<laughs> they ain't recognized. Yeah, yeah. You ain't right. Like, yeah, like, give me what you, what you got, man. Give it here. Give it here. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Um, uh, you listen to music? Uh, yes. So, uh, what song or artist got you into music or the, the genre you listen to? Uh, the song or artist that got me into music is uh, the Hit 'Em High, Hit 'Em Low. From Space Jam. Uh, it was the oh, music yeah? Video. I know that song, yeah. Uh, it was literally Buck Rhymes sitting on a hoop, basketball hoop, rapping boombastically and being lively and in your face and illmatic. And just, I was like, I want his album. And my mom took me to the mall to go get the Buster Rhymes album. Uh, I've been listening to hip hop ever since then. Uh, I like real hip hop, though. Hip hop that like, has a message that tells a story. Uh, that you know really rhyme, rhymes with bars and, and and things like that. Uh, but I like all types of music. I can listen to a lot of different things uh, while I'm drawing, while I'm driving. Uh, you know, Metallica, uh, Missy Elliott. Uh, you know, R&B. I just I just like all types of stuff. You know, the main time I listen to the soundtrack of uh, Space Jam and watch the movie. You know, I never seen that music video. That music video is one of the liveest music videos ever. <laughs> <laughs> I never seen it. I just I just know the song because uh of the soundtrack of course. And when the uh Mont Stars come out, that's what the song plays. <laughs> I d I just never thought about looking up the music video. That's crazy. Yeah, it was just, I wasn't looking for the music video. I don't even think I knew about I don't even think I knew about Space Jam. I just it was uh we were watching cable and that music video just we were watching music videos and that video came on next and Buster Rhymes was the one that stood out to me in that video as a player. Like, let me see. Hey, charismatic man, he has all that energy, you know. It's it's, it's crazy to see how how buff he is now compared to back then. <laughs> oh, I know. I feel like he kind of fell off a little bit since he cut off his locks, but he, he that still his, got. Some, you know. Yeah, that was his power, like Samson, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um. Um. Uh, Comic books. What comic related TV show or comic book got you in the comics? Uh, the comic book that got me in the comics was X Men number seventeen by Andy Kerbert. He was the uh, not Andy, but his brother. No, no, it was Andy. Not Andy. It was Andy. Um, X Men number seventeen. That was pretty awesome because I didn't like comic books. I thought they were dumb until I read that one. Um, and I've been on the comic book trail ever since then. Wanted to be, I want I used to want to be a cartoonist, but once I started reading comic books, I wanted to be a comic book artist. Now, what was special about that issue number 17? Uh, I connected with Wolverine character with the fact that he was the tiniest person in that group with the, um, and to, I mean, to be honest, with the weakest powers in the group, but he was the last man standing. He was defending his friends, he was protecting them. Um, there was some type of revenge issue or honor issue between him and Omega Red in that issue. Um, and Wolverine just kept getting tagged and tore up and kept getting back up. Uh, number one, because he wanted revenge on Omega, but he wouldn't let Omega Red hurt his friends anymore. And I, just, I really connected with that. And the fact that he was he was so short and everybody else everybody else's powers were more amazing than him. And uh, all he had was butter knives come out of his hands, but he was still fighting. Uh, I really, I really dig that, and I wish I, like, I wish I had his mentality and his strength, because uh, I used to get picked on. I was like the smallest person in my class. All right. Well, that's interesting. Well, what you just said leads to my next question. But going back to the Wolverine thing, so you think Wolverine powers are lamer or useless compared to a uh, Nightcrawler or Beast or Angel? I don't think they're. I don't think they're useless. I'm just saying. When you boil the powers down of the X Men, his is pretty lame. Compared so to what, what about Angel? He just got the wings. Angel has wings. The man can fly. Wolverine's powers literally have they they have to they, they have an accelerant to him. You have to kick his ass first for his powers <laughs> to. He has to be hurt. He has to be put through pain um, for his powers to work. And a lot of writers don't know how to write Wolverine, and they. Or they forget Wolverine is a samurai, that he is a warrior, that he is a soldier, and he knows how to fight. Like a lot of writers just lean on torturing Wolverine until he snaps into a berserker rage, which is, I mean, it's cool for certain moments, but not all the damn time. 
Um, but then you look at Cyclops, you're like, this dude has an optic blast, and it's not it's not heat vision. It is a a, a titanic pushing force from another dimension. Yeah, tossed into organic metal. Storm controls weather. The she can tap into the weather force of the world. Iceman turns himself into complete ice to control ice. He's a mega. He's a he's a mega. Um, what is it? A mega mutant? Or whatever. Yeah, mega. Yeah. Um, you know, Professor X has, is the strongest telepath in the world. Jean Grey has the Phoenix powers and tele- telepathy and telekinesis. Nightcrawler can teleport everywhere. And he has the best Halloween costume of all time. Beast, <laughs> super genius. He looks like a beast with super strength, agility. You know, it, like everyone's powers really isn't dependent on anything like Wolverine's is. And if people wrote him better, uh, that, that wouldn't be the case because, like, he can fight. He's a samurai. He's a warrior. He's a soldier, and they, no one ever really plays on it. They always just have him. They always have him just running in, swinging his arms like a, a windmill, instead of actually having him, um, you know, fight. Okay, I, I see where you're coming from now. I, I, I get you, because I'm a I'm a Wolverine fan, you know. Uh, so I was like, man, like my my thing. I was want to make a post or a TikTok video about it. Uh, is Wolverine really an X Men? Mm-hmm. He absolutely is. When? All the time. When he's a, when when did, when did he become an X Men? Uh, Professor X uh, and then recruited him to go save the X Men from the Living Island, the old X Men. So he was actually part of the team, or he just helped them out. He's part of the team. He's part of the new team of X Men. You know, because. I've been trying to I've been trying to figure it out. I don't know what team he was ever on. He was always helping the team. The only Wolverine I know that joined a team is uh X Queen Three. Nah, man, because they they had him as a teacher. He was a professor. He was the headmaster of the school. Okay, you can, you can teach. <laughs> <laughs> Just like to make my theory better, where's his uniform at? He never had the the, the blue and gold uniform. I mean, yes, he did, and he had the training uniform. When, well, well, one issue that somebody wanted to draw it on. <laughs> it was one of the Jim Lee issues, or a couple of them. But the X Men, all like all the X Men, have the blue and gold training uniform. But if we're talking about like official uniform, nobody has like a blue and gold uniform, with the exception of Cyclops. Oh, no, and they all we'll, the first, the first, the first five definitely have it. And uh, no, you're right and, about that, but like. Wolverine's costume has the branding, has the X in his belt. Yeah, from Jim Lee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, like uh, like Sto- even Storm and Gambit has has it. I I've not seen years before. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's always a theory. Just like um, I have one for uh, Avengers. I can't think of right now, but. I think it was the question was uh, who's the leader really of the Avengers? Is it Tony or is it or is it uh, Captain America? In the comic books, it's Captain America. At, uh, okay, after after he leaves. After he leaves. Yeah, when they dis- after they disbanded. Until now, basically. <laughs> Any any Avengers team that has Captain America on it, Captain America is the leader in the comic books, unless you're it's looking ca- at, unless you're looking at the comic books after the movies have come out, and then they they do what the movies have done, where Tony Stark is the leader of the X Men, but Captain America is the field commander of the Avengers. Sorry, field Tony commander. Stark oh, okay. Of the Avengers and Captain America is the field commander. That's what they establish in the movies, and the movies obviously being as popular as they are, that bled over into the comics. So what about uh, She-Hulk, Captain Marvel, and, and uh, Hank Pym? I don't think there was a time Hank Pym has been um, the leader. I know Captain Marvel has led the Avengers. Uh, Cap- Falcon Falcon asked Captain America as well has led the Avengers. Uh, She-Hulk has led the Avengers. They've all led different sections of the Avengers at different times. She Rogue is in charge of the Uncanny Avengers now. She's leaving. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Luke Cage had the new one? Yeah. Cage was the, a leader of the new Avengers. Yeah. Um, 
since you since you already said you were the shortest one in your class and you got picked on, uh, when did you find out you were the nerd? Uh, not till college. Oh man! <laughs> but it was uh, it was accepted there. Um, I don't think I realized I was a nerd in uh, high school because I had I had a circle of friends. I had a small circle of friends, but we was all cool. <laughs> and uh, and but also it might it I, it did not really register with me because I went to an all arts high school. So um, oh, y'all was nerds. <laughs> Uh, that's different. That, that was different from a, a regular high school. Well, that's probably why you didn't get robbed. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. But what triggered that in college? Oh, just being, I mean, I went to a, a art school and just, you know, being more self-aware of, you know, uh, I feel deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole and reading manga, anime. Uh, playing more video games, I realized like the people at my school really enjoyed a lot of the stuff that I enjoyed, and, and vice versa. And uh, uh, we were the art kids. And then I go to school down here in Columbus, and you know, all the cool kids go to Ohio State. <laughs> you know, oh, jocks and all that stuff. So we kind of had that, uh, kind of had a little bit of that that kind of like brought to my brought to my eyes, but like not in a shameful way because I, I absolutely love being a geek and. Uh, Columbus is a very, uh, it's a very comic book uh, inspired city. There's a lot. The comic book community, the geek scene in Columbus is very, very strong. And since uh, the movies have been dominated by comic book movies and TV shows being dominated by comic books, uh, the city has just bled more into the world of geek. Um, so you kind of when you have the hardcore, uh, old school fans like me, but then you have the casual fans. Um, who are, you know, it's a very large population of them. So uh, I knew what I was, but, you know, it wasn't discovered to find out in a shameful way. Okay, okay, okay. Um, a lot of people, even myself, and I talk about the nerd gap, you know, we uh did the nerdy stuff, like, early school, then, like, some point in time, mainly high school, it's like this gap, you know, we just didn't read or do anything nerdy. Then it popped back up later on in life, so and I I did part of that because um I, I mean you know I I played the Yu Gi Oh cards I knew about the X Men played video games all that but I still played sports so I was able to fit in yeah. any kind of group so I had no problem. Um, yes, like me, I played basketball, I played football still, and you know I it wasn't one of those quirky like clunky like oh I don't know how to do this my friends have to help me learn. Like, I was good at football. I was, I was decent at basketball. I ran track and field. Um, I rollerbladed and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's that's always the thing. I, I just want to – a lot, lot – it's, it's funny. I don't know. It's like an adolescent thing. Then you, you go back into it like I guess it was the thing you used to love. I don't know. I haven't – got to do more research and find out why we do things like that. But um, going to my next segment, um, it's called um, Hot Keys. And uh, uh, it's double meaning turn in comic books. You know, hot keys be key issues where a new writer, a new artist get on a project or a cure to get introduced. Or nowadays, a storyline get picked up as a TV show or a movie. Um, mm -hmm. As well in music, you know, it's a uh, but it's on a turntable for DJs or a producer to play certain sounds or songs to get people uh, turned up or live. You know, in an event or just playing a music for people. So. This part of uh, the show is uh, me picking out s certain questions and stuff that we discussed earlier and the stuff I formulated through the show that we want people to take from this interview to have, you know, highlight, highlight it in the whole episode. So we think getting that. Uh, 20 years in, you've been 20 years in comments. What kept you in comments so long and what actually got you doing comments? Um, what? Got me. What kept me in comic songs? I love comic books. I'm, I love doing them. I love drawing them. I love all aspects of working on comic books. But um, I really want to do comics. So I want to make that type of content that invigorates and excites other readers, other viewers. I want the same way when I first read that issue of X Men, and I was jumping out of my seat, and I was couldn't wait to turn the page, and I was, you know, excited. And like, you know, 
just heat it in the moment and reading it um because it was it was dope i want to make somebody else feel that way but, you know i want them to feel that and experience that with the characters that i create with the way that i drew them. um because i feel like it's a good feeling i think it's fun to, uh to enjoy and be excited about a thing that you're reading or you know or watching um has it all been indie work i'm sorry has it all been indie work, or you did some professional work as well? Oh, uh, well, I I freelance. Uh, I do freelance work as a sketch artist for Marvel and Upper Deck. So I work okay. with a sketch division from time to time. I get assignments from that. Um, mostly the work that I've done has been indie work for comic book work, but I've done some stuff for DSL, uh, for Subway, for Toyota. Uh, I've done stuff for the, the uh, Columbus, Greater Columbus Convention Center for the city down here but not, mainly mostly uh, in the world. now what what came first those projects or your own projects oh it just kind of like they all just started happening like uh my own projects at first were were the thing that was happening and you know the more i spread with my projects the more other people i asked me to do stuff and, and be a part of it and, and you know the more work you do the more work that gets out there than other people ask you you know you get you know you make certain relationships with people and they recommend you for things. So. Okay. Um, so what's the difference between five star and most epic? Uh, well, five star is a comic character created by Tony Clapper. Um, five star is one of our newest characters that he brought over. It's uh, three issues. Well, two issues in, we just finished the third issue. The five star is really a character named Kevin Terry. Um, he has cancer, and his best friend vows to help him cure of that cancer. And several months later, Kevin wakes up out of a coma, cancer-free, with weird new superpowers. Uh, but his best friend died in the experiment, which caused him to be in a coma. And has to decide how to move forward. Uh, most epic is just my tag, my, my moniker uh, that I, you know, become because of how energetic and enthusiastic and loud I am at comic book conventions or online or. Uh, whenever people see me, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much on the go all the time, like with the energy level. Um, I'm very passionate and enthusiastic about this guy. Uh, five Star is named a comic, comic book company, correct? Comic, yes. So uh, I remember previously, it was something else. Y'all merged before. Oh, no. Five Star is one of the titles that we have. Our comic book company is Freestyle Comics. Freestyle, okay, okay, okay. All right, but that merged though, right? Um, well, we signed Tony to our label. Oh, so um, he, he, he just came part of y'all. Okay. I yeah. thought it was a big, I thought it was a big thing that happened. Okay. Um, I used to be a part of short fuse media group and we were co-publishing um, with them. So that was in a way, it um, was a merger. It was a, and it was a great time that we had over short fuse. I learned a lot from Sean Mack. I even got to be the publisher of short fuse for a couple of years. Um, but after a while, I just wanted to kind of like get back to my own thing of just managing the books that I was uh, over and seeing what I could do with that. Um, and, uh, you know, we then we brought back Freestyle Comics as its own entity. Uh, we parted ways with Short Fuse, but uh, there, was no, there was no bad feelings or anything, like I said. It was a great time over there. I learned a lot uh, from Sean and, and Short Fuse. So once we established ourselves back as Freestyle Comics, we got our nose back down to the grind and figuring out what books we wanted to do, how we wanted to do our books, and uh, there were some other people floating out there that we wanted to bring under our label if they were interested, and Tony was one of those people. Okay, cool, cool. So, Freestyle Comics. So, uh, you say you had 12 titles. The flagship is Hot Shot, correct? Yes. So, uh, what you're on issue 12? Uh, yes, technically issue 13, because we have a zero issue. But yeah. All right, so... Now, have you been writing him for 20 years, or he's new here then? Uh, we've been working on Hot Shot for 20 years. My brother, Victor, wrote the first six and a half issues of Hot Shot. Uh, and then Victor wanted to take off and do his own thing with his own imprint and see how he could affect the world of comic books, which he has been killing it. Uh, with a lot of great titles and adventures in House Productions. Um, and um, Carrie Kelly, um, the creator of Diner Girl, uh, came over and uh, wrote a couple issues for us. Uh, and then once Carrie's uh, run was done, I took over the writing for Hot Shots. So I've been, I've been writing Hot Shots issue nine, but, you know, very involved in the plot 
and you know the main story, but you know, I, I I've taken that over now. So I do the whole thing. well, not the I do the whole thing with the writing and the drawing. Now, what were you first, a writer or an artist? Artist. Artist. Now, is it because you didn't want to write, or there was a skill you had to build to be a writer? It's a skill that I have to build to be a writer, and I'm still building. Okay. Uh, was Hot Shot your first thing you wrote? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, Hot Shot was not the first book I wrote. Actually, Emerald Quest was the first book I wrote, so I've been working on Emerald Quest. Just as long as Hot Shot, since I was in college or whatnot. But um, Emerald Quest was the first title um, that I that I wrote the whole thing for and published. All right, and I heard of Emer- Emerald Quest. That's crazy. You do artwork on that? Um, I do not. I have a, a art team I work with on that right now. Our current artist is Seth Demus. Oh, huh, that's that's why I, I I know about that title, but I don't know what title from you though. That's crazy. Um, James Gage was our original artist on that book. Huh, I don't know why. That's crazy. I I never associated to you and even that book, but I know about that book. <laughs> That's funny. Um, um so uh which so I'm gonna go to your other characters, but going back to Hot Shot. Now you twelve well thirteen issues in. So what's um are you gonna keep going with it until you know the wheels fall off or you got a point you wanna stop at the book? No, there is a stopping point. Hot Shot is uh, plotted out for um, the the dream gig. Uh, the dream distance is 100 issues of Hot Shot. It's all planned out. But as time has gone on and looking at the titles that we all have out right now, uh, I don't know how realistic that is because uh, the story is constantly invo- evolving. So um, the plots or the, the where we're going is the same place, but uh, how we're getting there is different, so it might not go up to 100 issues. But I do see, I do have an end point for Hot Shot. I don't see, at least Mike, uh, our character Mike as Hot Shot has a has a finish line. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm just doing math here. You know, 20 years in, 12 issues. Uh, since you're been on it, I believe it's it been coming out faster. So how often do you put out an issue for Hot Shot? Uh. And honestly, you're probably, if you average it out with everything, you're probably just putting out like an uh, a issue out every year and a half or something of Hot Shot. But we have, like, other books that have been coming out. And that's, you know, that's something that we're trying to work on or con- something that's constantly being worked on. Cause we have these, like I said, we have over 12 titles right now. And the last three years have been the most productive uh, for us. We've come out with a lot of books and, you know, hit trade venue and things like that. Uh, but I want to get more issues of Hot Shot out. And technically speaking, I already have issue 24 written and, and, and paid for. So that's kind of like my beacon of light in the darkness for me, too. That's my next goal. That's my goal I'm shooting for to get to issue 24 so we can produce it or whatnot. But I want to get up to doing uh, at least three issues of Hot Shot a year starting next year. Uh, since, you know, going back to 20 years again, um, uh... And the way you fund your books, has that changed? Um, I know now you do Kickstarter, but before Kickstarter wasn't popular. So um, has the way you've been funding these books changed? Or you still use the same method? Or, or I use whatever method, is, uh, whatever method gets us in. Back, uh, backroom deals, paying people out of my pocket, using Kickstarter, <laughs> uh, doing trades, whatever we can do to, to make it happen. Okay. And you full-time comics? Uh, no, I'm part-time comics. I have an art job during the day. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, Vigilance is your your other um, character, correct? Yes. Uh, that's a new character, though, right? New. Uh, so what's your plans with that, that character and that issue? Because you're having a trade for that coming out as well, right? Yeah, uh, at the uh, uh, next month uh, in November, we're going to do the uh, Volume 1 trade for Vigilance, collecting the first four issues, and then we're doing a collector's edition that includes Hot Shot number five, plus a bunch of extra stuff uh, going on with her um, for that trade. Um, and that's another book that I want to get to. You know, if we want to put up at least two issues a year of Vigilance as well. I mean, obviously, the real goal is to be able to get the team, the financial structure, and get the team where it needs to be to where 
we can do a book every other we can do all of our books every other month that's 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 the the, the big goal. that's what we would love to be able to do, trying to preach to that but yeah visions being one of our uh I wouldn't say she's a newer character. She's a newer title because she's always been in Hot Shop. Uh-huh. Uh, but she's very she Okay. Uh, <clears throat> is that um, you write that book or draw that book? I work on the plot. I share plot duties with Dan Cooper, our editor in chief. Um, right now, the writer, our current writer, uh, is Stephanie Monaro. All right. So uh, your role would be more like a uh, uh, and your company. Uh, not editor in chief, but like executive, I guess. I don't know. Uh, the the role we have for me is I'm the creative lead of this guy. Creative lead, okay. That's cool. And uh, what exactly is that? Um, a lot of the books at FSK are um, under my purview as far as creator of those titles. Um, and um, there's a direction I want all the books, all the books under me to go. So I guide all those plots. I have a lot of input on what we do with the characters. I have a ton of input on what we do with the characters, how we handle them, where we're going with them. Um, but I try to, when I'm working, like say, for example, with Stephanie Menard, um, me and her will sit down and we'll talk and I'll be like, so we need to get vigilance here at point Z with this end result. And then I need these two things to happen. However you make those three things and get me to point A is up to you, but that's where we need to be. And uh, she'll put out a script for us or kind of pitch what she wants to do. And, you know, we'll talk about that. Like, all right, that's cool. Go ahead and start writing that up. And then as she's writing things or whatnot, and then, you know, putting them down, you know, I'll give feedback. Daniel will give feedback um, because we have a whole world uh, that we manage. But I know what, like, I know what Heroes International's ultimate end goal or end position is going to be, where Emerald Quest is going to end, where Vigilance and Hotshot are going in where Cypher, where the characters of Cypher should be going um, to service, uh, Cypher's a side but to but Cypher, where that goes to service the main stories. Um, Charlie is the creator and, you know, writer of his book, Spider Squirrel, so we get access to Spider Squirrel from time to time when we need to, um, but Charlie really, he's the, he's the showrunner for his book. Um, Tony is the showrunner for his book, but um, we have to make sure that with Five Star being in our world, that the things that happen in Five Star's book are reflecting that in our books and vice versa. So we have to make sure that those things, they blend. So it's it's complicated. I mean, it's difficult, but it's super fun to to do these things. Um, I think we've done a really good job of uh, including Tommy's character in the FSK world and also what uh, Five Star has brought um, to our content as well. Um, so I've, I kind of have my hand, I have my hand in all the books to some degree. So all 12 titles share the same universe? Uh, no. Um, Spider Squirrel is in his own universe, but because of some uh, dimensional things that happen in that book, we get access to that character. So 11 titles. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so you said it's difficult. Um, I know DC Comics have a hard time, you know, Saying okay, this book, this book, this book. If something happens and it trigger things in the other book, so y'all being a smaller company, uh, that are able to do it. So what's the problem with DC? Why they can't keep it together? Like why can't Batman be dead in this issue? But you two weeks later, we got an issue of Batman still alive. So like, what's what's the hang up in the majors versus y'all? Um, I don't know. We don't answer to anybody. Um. But we've also been looking and you know, we're fans of Marvel and DC and all these other books and you know, we we watch and see what they do, so we try not to make the same mistakes that they make, but we don't have to answer to a board man. We don't have a committee that we answer to. We don't have um, uh, our projects while they are IPs, they're not big enough IPs right now to where it's like this IP is a product that is, you know, if I kill this character it's gonna affect our company. Like if we kill a character, it's not really going to affect our company. It's, it's going to add to our story. It may even do better for us. Or um, but if you kill Spider-Man, the well, Spider-Man's in 15 titles at Marvel. <laughs> yeah. Plus an animated series or two animated series, plus a video game, plus on Clove and plus on Lunchbox and stuff. So they have to be... <clears throat> their characters have breached a certain stratosphere to where they have to be very protective and careful with the decisions they make with those characters. Um, because now they are they are part of a big machine that is 
consistently generating them revenue and opening up the doors for them to be merchandise, TV shows, video games. We don't have to worry about that. All we're worried about is making a story that people can um, believe. All right. That's that's cool. That's cool. Uh, so, FSKCon. Uh, it's coming up, right? Next week. So, um, uh, what is that? And why did it start? Um, it started because uh, in the city of Columbus, people don't know who I am. <laughs> they don't know who Columbus is, and we wanted to put on an event that would show people um, that you have comic books in your own backyard being made by people. Um, I was doing the comic book shops or online, and people would be arguing about what Marvel and DC is doing, talking about they hate this, they hate that. And those same things that they want them to do, I'm like, we're doing. We've been doing. We've been doing since issue one of Hot Shot. Um, so why don't you try us out? Um, so it's really just our bullhorn to kind of make people self-aware of that we're out here. We're making comic books. We're out here with um, very diverse rosters of characters. And we're not trying to force feed that diversity to you. It's, you know, we're servicing the way it should be. And then it grew into a three-day event. Um, so we are at Focus Learning Academy. November 3rd to the 5th, we have over 25 pounds we're doing this week, that weekend. We have two food trucks, we have a DJ, and um, we're going to be doing an art gallery with the kids, working on creative characters. You Create is going to be down there with my Victor Dandridge. Uh, we have over 16, you know, 15 guests that will be there tabling with their children's book, their young adult books, their comic books, their prints, um, st- stickers, magnets, all types of stuff that they've created. Um, and it's not, like, I don't want to just promote freestyle comics. I mean, that's what it is. And it's hard as promoting our brand, promoting the characters, and trying to grow within the city um, that pretty much help create freestyle comics. But we also want to put on other creators as well and promote them because we're fans of their work. Uh, but the, I'd say the biggest caveat is we want to show young people that they can have a job and make money cosplaying. They can make money being an art director. They can make money making comic books. They can they can make money by using crafting. Um, they can make money by you know being a, a cast member. Let them know there's all these fields of creativity that actually exist that they are unaware of that they can do and you know and you know lead these creative lives uh, that that they that they want. Because there's a ton of kids out here you know streaming or wanting to stream and wanting to make money playing video games or wanting to make money as a cosplayer. And they don't know how to do some of these things, and uh, that's one of the uh, venues that we want to offer at FS Okay. Um, is everybody from Freestyle Comics based out of uh, Ohio? No. Um, no, it's not. So we try to use FS Comics as a way to get a lot of people that are out of state and out of town down here. It's almost like a, a family reunion. You we know, all get together in one spot and celebrate, you know, the year. It's, it's, it's our it's – our, annual event that we do this um we also announce what our new projects are anybody new that's coming to the team and things like that how many years running is it uh this is our sixth year okay okay um what i was gonna say so you brought up a good thing uh making money uh from cosplaying so how the hell do you make money from cosplaying uh, well, number one, you can make money from cosplaying by making costumes for other people. Um, one specific way is that if you are a good cosplayer, you are popular online, um, your Instagram, your TikTok accounts, you can make money through that, um, from, the, uh, from the videos that you make, from the posts that you get. Um, people can reach out to you for, they can say, hey, you have a very strong brand on your Instagram account. Can you advertise and promote for me and people can pay you for that? Or you can make really, 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 really good costumes and you can get hired out by Marvel Comics, by DC Comics, by video game companies and be flown out to combo conventions as those people's characters and rocking those costumes and things like that and getting paid to do that. Uh, one lady who I'm a very big fan of, she I think she's honestly the best cosplayer in the world. Um, she just makes books on how to cosplay, how to build, how to craft, how to design, how to sew. And she makes money from her books being in Amazon being in Barnes and & Noble and, and being online and people watching your videos. Once your videos and, and your posts reach a certain number of views and clicks, you start generating money um, from them, especially if you have your own YouTube channel or um, TikTok or anything like that. So uh, several, several ways to, to make income 
um, from cosplay, especially going out to comic conventions and um, being a featured guest and selling your photos and taking pictures and taking commissions. Um, yeah, so lots of ways. Okay. Uh, going back to your company, uh, being a new anime fan, you know, I see you with a Naruto shirt on and whatnot. Do you have any <laughs> mangas in your uh, titles? Uh, right now, the only mangas that I have... Oh, um, we are working on two mangas right now to be a part of FSK. Um, so those are in process uh, So for us to start dropping. Uh, we're looking to launch them in uh, 2024. Uh, what what held you back from doing those? I never had anybody that wanted to do them. Um, and <laughs> my plate was full. Um, we luckily had some people reach out with their content, and they want to release it through us, so Okay. So y'all do open submissions? Yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> hey, was y'all one of the companies that got picked up by Diamond? We were not. Um, we haven't applied through Diamond. Um, through my previous publisher, we took our books through um, Diamond, um, and we did not get uh, good results as Diamond. Uh, one of the things that they find hard to sell or get through is superhero books, and that's the main majority of the content. Um, and that was a while ago. Um, and I have not tried to push anything to Diamond yet. I just haven't been ready to make that decision um, to say, all right, let's let's go ahead and do it. And honestly, I need to. So I need to I need to re up and see what we're doing there. But I've really just been trying to build up our popularity because I feel like if we're going to be in Diamond, if nobody knows who are, who we are, then what's the point of being in Diamond? We're just going to put our books to them. Now, do you need Diamond to like actually like be successful, or you can you go without it? I don't think anybody needs Diamond to be successful because. In this day and age, you can make your own. You can make your own popularity, but that's what's hard: making your own popularity. So, uh, you know, is it, it is it like equivalent to like uh, going back to music? Is it like equivalent to being your stuff on on Apple Music, or is it equivalent like uh, your stuff getting on a, a playlist on Spotify or something like that? I would say it's comparative to Apple Music, being put on Apple Music. Okay. Um, combo shops order from them. They know what they want, they, and they go off with their clientele. So they they have to know what's on there. So you, know, you, you have to be known for them to buy. The, a comic shop is very rarely going to just pick up something brand new out of, a, out of a diamond unless they know the creator is well-known, the artist is well-known, or the writer is well-known. Um, you know, that studio has to be right now. They, they could see Freestyle Comics in there. They could see Hot Shot in there. see Visions in him. Like, hey, this is a cool looking title. Um, but I don't know who these guys are. So uh, I'm trying to work on the back. I, I mean, I'm not going to do that forever. I mean, at some point, I do want to apply and see if you get into Diamond because I think we more than qualify for whatever their regulations are. Um, but I'm trying to work on the popularity end of it so when the comic shops where people see our books and diamond they clearly know um, like oh shoot I've heard of FSK I've read some of those books and uh outside looking in I guess y'all do look popular to me but what is popularity you know what what you say you're not popular enough but uh seem like everybody knows officially you know Tony you everybody on I guess the social media bubble knows you so yeah. like What's keeping you from saying I'm popular enough to do it? Um, our website and our TikTok sales. Um, if I don't have, if I have to be in somebody's face to sell our books, our books and our cover, our content has to be able to sell itself. So if someone sees a video or they see us in the TikTok shop or they see us on our website, like people have to go to our website, like, oh shoot, I want to get that content. Like we need to, like, we don't have the sales on our website. That justify that we are at some type of popularity cusp here. Um, if I sell stuff on TikTok, that's because I'm doing a live stream video and I'm constantly pitching it and talking to people about it. If I sell stuff at a combo convention, it's because I'm talking at a combo convention. If I'm not, if like if like right now, somebody should be like looking like, oh shoot, I want some FCA books. They should be ordering something off our website. I should have. I, I would want to have, like, you know, at least at a minimum three to four sales a day off of my website on a regular, consistent basis. That would say, like, oh, yeah, people are starting to realize who we are, starting to pick up on who we are. Um, the TikTok shop, like, people know who we are because of that small circle. 
um, that that bubble that we're in, but I need people outside of that bubble to be, to buy our content. Like we have similar audiences right now, but when people who I don't know, who I haven't seen on my stream, who I haven't seen on our social media, start buying our books, that's when I know that our our um, audience is growing. Um. So that's that's the issue I have with indie comics in the little circle that we are. So I've seen a lot of that going on. People, they'll see a name, like your name, and just support the Kickstarter or whatever just based off your name. Now, mm-hmm. I had a huge problem with that. So um, uh, there's some companies. I, I want to say Godhood, Godhood, but I still believe he's he's more of that. But there's some companies that you see the name, then you're like, okay, the title's just saying third. Um, like myself, like I push my my title Legacy View out more, so they're familiar with the brand more than me because, um, just in my experience, you know, I, I buy you know Hot Shot or whatever to support you, but mm-hmm. I probably would never read the book or become a fan of. It. I'm just supporting you because you know you're a cool dude. Right. So I've seen that issue in the little any um, um world. But why why is that a thing in in, in the indie world versus you know uh, I guess the 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 popular uh, companies like the Boom Studio, the Image, and stuff like that? Because you'll see a, a Spawn book and just buy it, you know, because Spawn. But in indie world, you just buying it because of the, the person. You're not really buying it because of the character or the story. I think you buy any books. A lot of people buy any books because of the person because um, a lot of us are genuine and, and pretty honest about. Our love and passions over the people want to see us succeed, so we get support. Um, I think you're very, you have a very good point um, um, about people just buying books because they know who we are, or they know my name, or they know who we are, or whatnot, so they want to support. But I think you need both type of customers. You need those customers that are supporting you because they know who you are, and you need customers that are buying you buying the book because of your brand. And that's what we're trying to trying to get people to believe in the brand of Hot Shot, of our visions. And, them, you know, trying to get them to be true fans. Because the other part of that is, is getting people to come back for the second, the third, the fourth, or the fifth issue. Yeah. And that you that brought up a great point because I realized I don't sell a lot of the other issues, but I keep selling consistently is one, two, and three. Um, but I need, but I do. I mean, I do have people coming back for those other issues, but I need those numbers to match the people that are buying the number one issues because we've sold so many number one issues. What is it that we need to do to get these people to come back? Because people aren't reading them. They're supporting us because they see us out here. They see this hustle. They see that grind. Um, and, um, but I think if people read the book and they read the first issue, they were, you know, they come back for the second. Uh, we put a lot of work, blood, tears, and sweat um, into our stories and our content. So it's not just, it, it's, a, it's a several fold battle of getting them to buy the book, but then getting them to take it home and read it. Um, and then, you know, and actually giving them a chance to want to come back from the second issue, from the third issue, and things like that. But you don't have to uh, worry about that because with the bigger studios, because there's bigger studios that are out here, they have the um, they have the advertising power that we don't have to keep force feeding um, these characters and these comic books into our face. Plus, they take up all the realty space in comic book shops. Uh, they look like a full, they're a legitimate brand. Um, and we are an indie brand. For most people, we're not legitimate. We're not uh, official. And Marvel, DC, and Image, and everything like that is official. Um, you know, that people feel like their money is a safer bet on these studios with these stories because these studios with these stories can produce all this content. They have massive amounts of content, and they are on shirts, and they are talked about. Um, they have conversations about it. If people would have as many conversations about our indie books as they do with Marvel and DC, a lot of us would be having more sales. Um, and that's not to knock the content or to the level of a guy for studios, um, because I believe uh, he's done something where he's broken through that through that ceiling to where people are buying his books based off of the books, based off of the art, based off of the work. Um, and they're coming back because they're reading his story. And his story just happens to be good as well. Um, but he's, I feel like he's also learned a lot of things about marketing and advertising that, you know, that some of us still have to learn. Um, I really lost my train of thought. But, um, 
Um, just, okay, like, so I do a unorthodox way of setting my comics. Uh, I, I just started doing my comic books 2019. Uh, my first con I did was this year, like stuff like that. So I sell, I sell my book like I sell mixtape, like I'll be selling mixtapes. So sell out my trunk and stuff like that. People at work. And what you was saying about people coming back to get an issue one, issue two, issue three. Uh, uh, um, I, I think I figured out the way because uh, I sell, you know, like number ones like you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I ran out. So <laughs> when, I, when I'm selling them, I probably got issue two and three left. And so I sell that to them. So I feel like they liked issue two or three. It'd be just like the back in the day. You got that uh, number 17 of X-Men. You don't know what the hell was going on. You don't know what happened prior to. So now you want to go get the 16, 15, so on, so on. So I feel like that, that should trigger them to get, go back and get number ones and fill in the blanks of the missing comics. As well as um, uh, you're doing trades now. So I thought about the stock doing my issues one through five and to do the trades. If they have issue one through five, cool. If they don't, cool. Now I got a trade. So you got to buy this whole volume of these books instead. Like, you could have got the single issues back in the day, but now you can't. So now I'm slick forcing them to get one through five. But now I, I assume and feel like they should be more invested in the story now because they pay a little bit more money mm-hmm. and they got a good chunk of a story arc as well. That's pretty smart. I think that's uh, something we're trying to move forward to, towards to once we get our trades reprinted, our old trades reprinted, get our new ones established for new year. Really pushing my trades. No, no, no. So, uh, how do you feel? How, how do you feel about trades? So, are these your first trades, or you've been doing trades? Um, we we did trades. I just sold out of them and didn't get a uh, chance to really get any of them reprinted. Um, we wanted to redesign the like, uh, covers and stuff for them. Um, but no, so this will be our third and fourth trade that we do. So we've, we've had the clearance with them. Now, are you a trade buyer or are you a floppy buyer? I'm either. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions I got. Yeah, for that segment. So I'm going to go to my last segment of the show. Um, it's called Digging in the Crates. Um, no double meaning turn, you know, in comic books, you know, you want to dig in the crates to find that old X-Men, you know, issues that you um, you fell in love with. As well as music, you go back and find, you know, that, that, that Bust Rhymes album or, or a CD from back in the day. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go back and comb through um, stuff in this interview and pull out something so that people can go home with after the interview. Um, so, uh, getting your popularity up and I'm saying you want to be a cartoonist and whatnot. Um, I assume you want some of your projects to get animated, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, how would you break in to the silver screen with your uh, your sit your uh the titles? Like what what maybe hot maybe a hot shot, but who would you use to break into it, and what platform would you use to break into the uh silver screen? Um. I would use, uh, if I was trying to break into a platform, I would want to break into the um, toy industry. Um, and I would use our whole line of the Freestyle Comics verse, uh, set them up in waves. Uh, there's a very specific type of way I want to make toys because uh, I, mean, I am a toy collector. And um, my preference would be toys. Uh, but chances are, if the door is really open, it would be an animated series. And I would prefer to do it on Amazon and Netflix. Uh, you know, eight to ten episodes for a season to introduce them to a, a hero's uh, journey story on the comic shop. That was the first six-part story that we had. And, you know, there's room to add to that to really flesh that out. Yeah, with a right. toy thing though, so you'd be more like like how GI Joe and Transformers was back in the day. Like, it's a whole bunch of toys, and the toys is the main focus, but it's a show to go with it. Yeah, um, my toys would be aligned. I would really speak to hardcore toy collectors um, that, you know, collect, uh, you know, Marvel Legends and stuff like that. I would really speak to them the way we set up the toy line. 
but also making it available to you know the casual you know kid who just wants to get a hot shot with it. Uh, last question. I didn't I didn't talk about it previously, but what what is your company or your line of titles? What age group are they are they geared towards? Oh, they're geared to if your company will let your kids watch the Marvel the MCU movies, that's how they're geared. So okay. you know, parents have different levels for that content. And now that's kind of the area that we try to flex in for stores. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Um for people who listen to this, uh after you know your, your your convention happens and they want to find out more about your creators and, and you yourself, what can they follow y'all at? Oh, they can follow us at fsknow.com um, or fsknow.com, and uh, you can always find me as most epic art on all social media. All right, and should they be on the lookout for anything? Um, we got a bunch of stuff coming out uh, from from the end of this year and the beginning of next year, so we got a lot of content coming. All right, cool, cool. And once again, man, thanks for coming on. It's been great. Thank you for having me, man. So sorry, y'all. I had it for my face mask on because I don't know what I got. But shout out to Michael Watson, man. Y'all check out that Hot Shot comic and everything at Freestyle Comics. And make sure you check them out. They're doing great work over there. They're trying to be one of the big names like everybody else. So check them out. And check out my books, too, because I'm trying to be over there, too, at LegacyReview.com. And follow me at Legacy Review. And follow my co-host at Specs 6 on all social media. And you want to be on the show, hit us up at channelgreenbox at gmail.com or hit us up at channelgreenbox on social media. And that's it. Okay. Make sure you like and subscribe. I don't think I ever say that. But do that and rate us. And I'm out.